This is Russia, and these are Russia's neighbors. The nation is currently locked in several disputes over land and territory, and it's waging war over its borders. Yes, I'm being literal. Russia is literally going to war over its borders and territories in the pursuit of what it feels belongs to them. Russia has demanded that NATO should stop expanding eastwards. U.S. soldiers to Russia's land border. Training with live fires in NATO ally Estonia. Threatening Russian security. Canada is to defend Latvia from any aggression by Russia. Japan said a cordial dispute. Over the islands goes back to Russia claiming ownership. The Russian president Vladimir Putin suggested the two nations sign a peace treaty. Norway next shares land and maritime borders with Russia. Troops have surrounded Ukraine. People wanting to cross the border between Poland and Belarus. For so long, Russia has warned about its borders and territory being encroached on. But no one really thought Russia would wage war. Well, at least until they did. Now Russia is in a massive war. Oh, sorry, it's a military operation with Ukraine. And regardless of who you think is winning it, there are massive casualties on both sides. Ukraine might be their current and biggest focus, but it's not the only land that Putin may be willing to spill blood for. Today, I'll explore the Russian border crisis and the nations entangled with Russia in it. Again, the Russian-Ukraine border problem may be the most publicized, but it's not the only one. And if we're going to predict or prepare for the future, we must go into the past and learn. Who knows, your country might be involved in one of these disputes with Mother Russia. The US, Canada, and even Finland have a border crisis with Russia, as you will soon see. Could that mean an impending war, too? Please take a moment to like this video. Any videos that dive into military conflicts and the like tend to get the shorter end of the stick with the YouTube algorithm. Every like helps me correct this, well, according to me, injustice. Back to business basics. See what I did there? Anyway, this is what the Soviet Union looked like at the height of its power. Many of Russia's territorial disputes came from the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. When the Soviet Union fell, several states emerged, with Russia being the major parent state. With the emergence of these new states, so too did the issues of borderlines, demarcations, and lineage stresses start. This is primarily where the Ukraine issue comes into play. I will cover this in depth later in the video, but to start with, let me talk about a major but lesser known dispute between Russia and another superpower, Japan. It's always with the biggest rivals that the fiercest conflicts emerge. These are the beautiful yet heavily debated Kuril Islands, a fierce battleground of Russia and Japanese aggression. When the Russian invasion of Ukraine began, with Russian troops causing havoc in Ukraine, the Japanese foreign minister, Yoshimasa Hayashi, revived Tokyo's claims on the southern Kurils, the disputed area, describing the region, which it refers to as its northern territories, as an integral part of the Pacific state. With the havoc that Russia was raining on Ukraine, it only made sense that other nations with whom Russia has border issues were especially sensitized to the matter. Do you know who didn't get that memo? Russia. Instead of inspiring confidence, Russia withdrew from all peace talks on the matter. To add insult to injury, Russia began to conduct military drills in the disputed region in what was meant to be a show of force against both Japan and the Western Bloc. Talk about diplomatic failures. Well, the question is, what exactly is the dispute that Japan is so sensitive about and Russia is so controlling over? 
You see, the territorial dispute between the two is over the de facto maritime boundaries that separates the territorial waters of the two countries. And those waters are the Kuril Islands. These are an island chain located between Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula and Japan, a country that on its own is a collection of islands. I'm not kidding, it really is a collection. In its peninsula, Japan is comprised of over 6,800 islands. This Kuril Island chain, which both Russia and Japan claim, is the main source of the contention, and it has been since at least the mid-19th century. Dating back to the 19th century, even to the present day, the Kuril Islands chain, or at least certain parts of it, have at different points changed hands between Russian and Japanese control. The territorial crisis is unique in that it comes in two forms. The first one is, who even owns these islands between the two powers? The second question, the one that has been in discussion recently, is what islands constitute the Kuril Islands in the first place? Let me give you the rundown on both, starting with who owns these islands. From 1855, when the two Pacific nations established their first official ties, to 1875, when the Treaty of St. Petersburg was signed between Japan and Russia, the Kuril Islands were divided between the two countries. This was the harmonious time when equality reigned supreme. The Treaty of Shimoda, formerly known as the Treaty of Commerce and Navigation between Japan and Russia, was signed in 1855, serving as the first treaty between the Russian Empire and the Empire of Japan. The actual terminology used in the Treaty of Shimoda when it came to this island's matter was that, henceforth, the borders between Russia and Japan will pass between the islands Ituru or Eturafu and Uru or Urupu. The whole island of Itarup belongs to Japan, and the whole island of Urup and the other Kuril Islands in the north constitute possessions of Russia. Time passed, and with the Treaty of St. Petersburg that was signed between the two countries in 1875, Russia voluntarily handed over control of the entire Kuril Islands chain to Japan. It wasn't for free, though. They in exchange received full ownership over the large island of Sakhalin, which extends from north to south, adjacent to the Russian mainland in the Pacific, near the northern parts of Japan. This is where some of the problems are said to have started. Because as nations that spoke different languages, translation discrepancies between different official texts created an ambiguity over which islands should be considered part of the Kuril Islands. That was the gateway to the problems of what the Kuril Islands are, where they start, and where they end. More on that in just a minute, though. As the years passed and diplomatic relations failed, Russia eventually seized all the Kuril Islands as part of its victory after the Allied powers won the Second World War in 1945. Since Japan had allied with Nazi Germany, they were part of the losers, and as such, received the shorter end of the agreements that came. Talk about being on the wrong side of history, huh? What makes the Kuril Islands dispute special, however, is that, unlike other concessions that Japan made with Russia, no agreements were signed. Formerly, Japan and the then Soviet Union never signed a peace agreement to officially end their hostilities and create new alliances. Since then, Japan has attempted talks with Russia. At this point, the negotiations have come down to what islands are regarded as part of the Kuril Islands. When you look at the island chain, Russia claims sovereignty over the entirety of it, and that consists of all 18 islands. Japan, on the other hand, declares that the four southernmost islands on the chain, which are Iturup, Kunashir, Shikotan, and Habomai Islands, are Japanese territory and are not part of the Kuril Islands. They argue that these named islands should not be, by any means, a part of the so-called Russian territory. Take a look at this map. It will give you some perspective. You can see how the Russian borders have encroached closer and closer to Japan with time, and you can see just how close the four islands are to Japan. Were Russia to use them as military zones, Japan would be very vulnerable, and that's their fear. And Japan is not wrong to fear the possibilities that these islands could create. The Kuril Islands offer several military and political advantages for Russia. First, due to their geographical position, they make it easier for Russia to maneuver its Pacific fleet of warships and submarines into the Pacific Ocean, a task that would otherwise be very difficult during sub-zero temperatures in winter. This gives their navy better mobility and quicker reaction times during conflicts. 
This is an advantage that cannot be understated. Secondly, on the chessboard of global politics, Russia remains wary that, should Japan regain sovereignty, it could use these islands as a base for its armed forces and deploy long-range missiles from them. Putin is very paranoid and has always seen himself as surrounded by enemies. Japan's close alliance with the US might mean that if returned, Tokyo may allow US Marines based in Japan to set up a military base on the Nansei Islands, further heightening concerns for Russia. This could also lead to the Sea of Ohotsk, an area considered to be Russian jurisdiction, being forced to accommodate foreign-owned military ships. This is a complete no for Putin. He cannot harbor enemies in his backyard. So you see, friends, Russia's reason for keeping the islands is Japan's reason for not wanting them to have them. You see the irony? And this, the military exercises that Russia performed in the Pacific, do not serve to ease Japan's worried mind at all. Before Russia removed itself from the negotiating table, both nations had made statements that indicated resolution-seeking. The Japanese Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, before Russia invaded Ukraine, had said, It's extremely regrettable that 76 years after the war, the issue of the Northern Territories hasn't been resolved, and a peace treaty between Japan and Russia hasn't been agreed upon. Even Russian President Vladimir Putin also expressed his intent for resolution, saying, we believe that the absence of a peace treaty in our relations is absurd. However, the world before the invasion of Ukraine and the world today are two very different things. Most nations just see Russia as being bloodthirsty. And it's no surprise that talks between Russian and Japanese delegations have collapsed. Peace talks that will produce a concrete political resolution may not be something that will happen in the near future. And that's something we might just have to accept. Japan, however, is not the only superpower that Russia has had border disputes with before. Let's take a look at the Russia-China dispute. By the way, as I've mentioned before, some of the topics I cover are not liked by YouTube or sponsors. That's why I don't really have many sponsors in my videos, but it's no problem. I recently launched a Patreon where you guys can support the videos directly. These topics and videos are made possible by the support of my Patreons. So, if you enjoy the subjects I cover, and you have the money to spare, please consider supporting the videos on Patreon by clicking the link in the description. Though Russia and China are as thick as thieves, no pun intended, regarding their actions towards both Ukraine and Taiwan, the two have had fierce land disputes before. Looking back in history, Russia, perhaps more than any other country, has been China's biggest and most ferocious ally even helping the CCP to rise to power in the very beginning. This is something I actually covered in depth in one of my more recent videos. Feel free to check out that video and get a more comprehensive understanding. The link will be in the description below. Despite the two nations being heavy allies, in the mid-1950s, Moscow and Beijing began to drift ideologically over what they perceived as the future direction of communism. China at that point favored continued aggression towards imperialist nations while the USSR began to consider peaceful coexistence with the United States. It's actually funny to think of the Soviet Union as the mild-tempered one here. In no time, however, the ideological differences between the two nations escalated very quickly and started to result in both the Chinese and the Soviets competing for territory and control of communist satellite states. It was a battle for who would become the leader of communism in the New World. What started as a veiled competition soon lost its veil. By the 1960s, Moscow and Beijing boasted very direct and public critiques of each other in the media. This added to the collapse of the diplomatic relations between the nations, with Russia even recalling thousands of Soviet advisors from China. They even went on to cancel the economic and military aid that they had always provided to China. I mention all this so that you can have a background as to how matters have escalated. It's easy to resolve conflicts amongst allies, but conflict resolution at a time of diplomatic struggle is, well, tough, to say the least. And the latter is exactly what happened. You see, tensions between the two nations finally exploded in March of 1969, along the Usiri River, 
which was the poorly demarcated border between the Soviet Union and Northeast China. There was no love lost, and what could have been solved became a blazing fire. What was the disputed land, you ask? Well, the history of the conflict came from a gross alteration of the Russian border by a border commissioner. Back in 1869, he persuaded the Chinese to accept and sign a small-scale map that he had. On the map, he had given the Russians territory that wasn't theirs. Where the previous arrangements had left the Amur and Asuri as boundary rivers, and therefore shared international waterways, his map made them exclusively Russian by marking the international boundary along the Chinese banks. There were other alterations, but they all served the same purpose, to give Russia an advantage. As the years went on, the Russians began depicting this commissioner's version of the boundary on their maps. And over the years, authoritative European cartographers came to follow suit. From the early 1920s, the appropriated lands were occupied by Soviet citizens, thus making them Soviet territory. China, however, claimed the islands, as they were on the Chinese side of the river. China was working with what the international law adhered to, but at that point, the Soviets wanted, and had already effectively controlled, almost every island along those rivers. That is why China felt that the way to get them back was through military conflict. What was seen as just two allies arguing soon escalated into something much more. It was no laughing matter when the border harassment escalated into a shouting match on March 2nd and March 15th, resulting in heavy casualties on both sides. This had officially become an armed conflict bordering on war. These military tussles continued for a while as each of the two nations began to prepare for war. When you read your history books, you will see that this is one of those moments where the world watched and feared that nuclear conflict and perhaps a third world war was about to break out. Repeatedly during this time, Moscow hinted at the possibility of a preemptive strike against Chinese nuclear installations, while China built up a vast underground network of tunnels and shelters to be used in case of a nuclear attack. What's interesting in this matchup and the potential war was that at that time in history, the Soviet Union was actually in control of all the territory that the Chinese were claiming. Moreover, militarily, Moscow was in a superior position. The Chinese happened to be in a much larger numbers, but weak militarily. However, military confrontation and buildup on Sino-Soviet borders proved to be a drain for the Soviet Union, especially so when Moscow was locked in a global, political, ideological, and strategic rivalry with the West. Fortunately for the rest of the world, this armed conflict subsided and the border crisis came to an end in 1969. This was a result of Russian and Chinese delegates meeting and coming to terms. For decades after this, the two countries would keep coming back to the table, and in 2003, the border agreement between Russia and China was signed, putting a rest to the disputes. China was granted control over a handful of the islands. On the 21st of July 2008, a Chinese foreign minister and his Russian counterpart signed an additional Sino-Russian borderline agreement marking the acceptance of the demarcation of the eastern portion of the Chinese-Russian border in Beijing. An additional protocol, with a map affiliated on the eastern part of the borders both countries share, was signed. The agreement also includes the Chinese ownership of another island and a half. This might stand as one of the few border conflicts in history to see a mutually agreed upon end. I, for one, am happier because of it. Two superpowers have no business fighting over territory unnecessarily. The world doesn't need any of that. Solving this large issue of contention, no doubt, gave Russia and China the space they needed to repair and grow their diplomatic relationships further. And now, they stand as very crucial trading partners for each other. Let's move on to another border dispute that I know you're very familiar with. That is the border dispute that threatens to take the whole of Europe to war with it. That is the Ukraine and Russia border dispute. Many think that Russia's aggression towards Ukraine is something that started last year when Russia invaded Ukraine. No, it's something that started in 1991, the very day that the Soviet Union fell. As Russia emerged as the successor state to the Soviet Union, 
the largest of all the countries that were born, Ukraine was the second largest. Putin never really got over how many resources, infrastructure, and people Ukraine got away with after the Soviet collapse. That was the birth of this feud. With Ukraine, it's much more than a border crisis. Yes, Putin wants land from Ukraine, but he also wants resources, and he wants people. This is something I talked about in my Russian population video. Take a look at it on the channel, you will find it interesting. This Russian aggression and, well, greed, is what led Putin to the Crimea incident in 2014, the first major highlight of the border crisis between the two nations. President Vladimir Putin casts his shadow across the invasion of Ukraine known as Crimea. Russian troops spreading out to take control of military bases in strategic Crimean Peninsula. Russia's decision to send troops into Crimea rightly drawn global condemnation. The Russian military must stand down. The Russian forces are consolidating their grip with the support of a largely friendly local population where voters decided to rejoin Russia. In law, the Crimea is Ukrainian. But in the hearts of many. With the stroke of a pen, Russia defied protesters in Kiev, minorities in Crimea, and leaders across the Western world. The treaty formalizing the annexation of Crimea. Western countries condemn the move and imposed economic sanctions against Moscow. It will not be recognized by the international community. In 2014, in Crimea, a region of Ukraine, it was claimed that dissension started to arise as pro-Russian protesters started calling for the region of Crimea to return to Russia, as they wanted to return to their roots. Most publications called this a farce, and they stated that a good number of these masked, violent protesters were all Putin's puppets. The claim is that Putin was arming and funding them to cause havoc in the resource-rich area of Crimea. As Ukraine began to attempt to act on the dissension, Russian authorities sent armed troops into the region to protect the Russians there. This was frowned upon as a provocation and a violation of Ukrainian sovereignty, but oh well, you know Putin. He really doesn't give a care in the world. With pressure mounting and Russian interference at an all-time high, on March 6th, the Crimean parliament voted to secede from Ukraine and join the Russian Federation with a public referendum on the matter scheduled for March 16th, 2014. The move was hailed by Russia and broadly condemned in the West. Think about it. A province of your country, crucial to the nation, just wakes up and says, oh, well, you know, we're leaving. That had to hurt. On the day of the referendum, observers noted numerous irregularities in the voting process, including the presence of armed men at polling stations. It was clear what was going on, and yet little really could be done to stop them. It was no surprise to anyone when the results were announced, and it was an overwhelming 97% vote in favor of joining Russia. The Ukrainian government, of course, rejected this notion, but Putin had everything he needed to take this from a border crisis to a complete annexation. Though Russia was hit with several sanctions by the US and the EU, they didn't shake. Sanctions don't really seem to have the desired effect on Russia, as recent history has shown. Once the referendum was done, Russia did not waste any time. Russian troops moved to occupy bases throughout the peninsula, including the Ukrainian naval headquarters in Sevastopol, as Ukraine initiated the evacuation of some 25,000 military personnel and their families from Crimea. On March 21st, after the ratification of the annexation treaty by the Russian parliament, Putin signed a law formally integrating Crimea into Russia. And that, ladies and non-ladies, is how the whole region was stolen by Russia. The subsequent years saw a militarization and siphoning off of Crimea's resources, revealing Putin's true intent all along. As if that wasn't enough, 2022 saw Russia going back to bully Ukraine under the guise of, well, several excuses. Russian President Vladimir Putin has launched a major full-scale invasion on multiple fronts. Ukraine is now a nation at war. A full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine woke to explosions around the capital, Kiev. In the last few hours, they've gone from being civilians to now being soldiers. 
having to fight on the front line. Sudden as it was brutal and relentless, Ukrainians woke up to find themselves... ...has turned now into an invasion. Military trucks and tanks were seen moving into the city with white painted Z signs on... The ...ringing out here in Kyiv and cities across this country. Vladimir Putin warning other countries of any attempt to interfere with the Russian action will lead to, quote, consequences they have never seen. What Putin called a military operation is now the biggest war since the end of the Second World War. Not content to let Ukraine be its option, Putin has been pouting every time Ukraine acts independently. Just like a jealous big brother does when the younger brother is the cool one. Russia has been determined in telling Ukraine who to befriend, who to trade with, and what the future looks like. This has increased under the rule of Zelensky, who Putin does not have in his pocket, and hence the confrontations and the invasion. On the 24th of February, 2022, Putin sent troops into Ukraine from the north, south, and east with the purpose of demilitarizing and denazifying Ukraine. His declared aim was to protect people subjected to what he called eight years of bullying and genocide by Ukraine's government, claims which have no basis in evidence. Again, Putin was using the same card he used to annex Crimea, and this time he was applying it to the whole dang country. It was framed as an attempt to prevent NATO from gaining a foothold in Ukraine. These claims that Putin made of Nazis and genocide in eastern Ukraine were completely unfounded. But they have formed part of a narrative repeated by Russia since its proxy forces seized parts of the eastern regions of the country in 2014, triggering a war with Ukrainian forces. It's like no one knows what Putin is talking about except Putin himself. It's clear that Putin wants Ukraine and he is willing to go to war over it. I'm really even hesitant to call this part of the video a border crisis because the man doesn't want a part of Ukraine, he wants all of it. From time to time, he hid behind Ukraine's desires to join NATO, claiming that Ukraine joining NATO would be a threat to Russian security. However, in March of last year, Ukraine's president, Zelensky, publicly accepted that joining NATO would not happen. He offered that Ukraine become a non-aligned, non-nuclear state, but negotiations broke down. I say broke down, but it's clear that despite getting what he asked for, Putin has no interest in peace. Perhaps he thought he could take over Ukraine without much challenge, or that he could intimidate a surrender. But, oh well seems that things are not going that well for him. The Ukrainian resistance has been much steeper and harder than he thought. Soon, it'll be a year since he started his costly and devastating military operation that is hurting his economy more than he would care to admit. My prayers and thoughts are with all the victims of this war. Such conflicts have no winners, just losers. Russia has had a few other minor disputes as well. There are several of these with countries you would not even expect. Let me run you through them. Let's begin with their arch nemesis, the United States of America. Russia challenges the US over the ownership of Alaska. Alaska became the 49th state of the U.S. in 1959, and it's located in the northwest region of North America. It was acquired by the United States in 1867 from Russia. However, the challenge is that most Russian nationalists don't recognize the sale of Alaska. They either claim that Russia never got paid, or that it was only a 99-year lease that ended decades ago. It all really depends on who you're listening to. The point is that... Russia wants Alaska back. And, well, I just don't see that happening, do you? Although the USSR and the US signed a USSR-USA maritime boundary agreement, Russia now refuses to recognize it. Russia demands huge swaths of ocean and possibly some islands, and even all of Alaska as payment. Crazy, isn't it? In addition, many Russians also lay claim to Hawaii and Northern California because Russia had some military presence there in the 19th century. These claims are loose at best and unfounded at their worst, but hey, who knows? Maybe the US Congress might wake up feeling generous. Whilst we are still in North America, Russia also has a maritime border dispute with Canada. 
Russia claims some kind of exclusive rights to a huge part of the Arctic Ocean that are not Russian, according to any international treaties. In the past, the Russian Navy has promised to sink foreign ships that dare to set course through their waters. The list continues. Next on Russia's list of disputes is Norway. The Soviet Union occupied a small part of Finnmark, Norway, at the end of the Second World War. After the war ended, however, Russia refused to return it. Look, whoever taught Moscow that once you touch something it's yours, doomed us all. This is one of the lighter border disputes, because though Norway demands the land returned, they're not very pushy about it. This is in large part because the land is worthless. Makes you wonder why Russia would even risk diplomatic relations by holding on to something useless. Russia has even gotten as bold as to feel offended when Norway conducts its business on its islands and outposts. This headline from 2020 is a perfect summation of their entitlement. Not to say that any country does not have the right to enforce its own border rules, but it's interesting to note the countries that Russia has beef with. And you might not guess the next country on this list, so let me just go ahead and tell you, it's Finland. During the Second World War, something that is becoming a bit of a trend in this discussion, Russia annexed about 10% of Finnish territory. To this day, that land is not returned, and the Finns want it back. Russia's border issues involve other countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Belarus. The story is mostly the same, historical territories that Russia refuses to relinquish. In certain situations, like when Latvia and Estonia joined the EU, they were forced to resolve their outstanding territorial disputes, with no other choice but to comply. Their government signed agreements with Russia, giving up the stolen territories. The overall issue is the same. Russia is not up for territory negotiation, especially with former Soviet states. Even in the present day, Russia is operating as if it is the Soviet Union, something that does not surprise anyone given that unifying all former states of Russia is Putin's dream. I started the video with Russia's disputes with Japan and China as they're subjects that are not spoken about enough. However, as you have seen throughout this video, Russia has had, and in some cases still has, a lot of issues with several countries. These conflicts, if Ukraine has taught us anything, are seconds away from becoming military problems. We, as a global community, must keep ourselves alert to various extremes that may happen. Like Ukraine showed us, it quite literally can happen to anyone. So my last video was demonetized, again. If you haven't seen it, it's no surprise. Whenever a video gets demonetized, YouTube usually bans it too. So it was probably never shown to you. If you're wondering why it's demonetized, well, let me tell you. For the simple fact that it's covering the CCP's mistreatment of Uyghurs. Apparently, shedding light on this is a sensitive topic and can't be monetized. I don't know, it's extremely frustrating because this is now the second video covering the CCP's unjust actions that have been demonetized. The first one was about the CCP's illegal occupation of Tibet. So I'm starting to see a trend here. Every time I shed light on stuff that exposes the CCP, the video is quickly demonetized and suppressed. But fortunately for me, I don't have to depend on YouTube monetization because of my patrons. That's why I have no plans to stop covering topics that make the CCP and YouTube unhappy. If you enjoy my coverage and want to support my future videos that uncover sensitive topics like these, please consider supporting the videos on Patreon. The link is in the description. Without the support of my patrons, honestly, these videos wouldn't be possible. So I am so eternally grateful to you guys. Thank you so much for everything.